Welcome back, guys. So welcome to ACDC stage again. And uh, now I'm saying hi to a front-end developer evangelist, a, also a dog lover, Amy Kapernik, who is uh, joining us from Australia. Hi, Amy. Hi. Uh, uh, good to see you. Good to hear from you. Uh, first time in this conference talking to someone from Australia. I know it's a late evening already so we won't hold you long so um as always uh, you can ask questions um, for amy in the chat and i'll be joining at, uh, in the back at the back uh, of the presentation to to ask these questions so amy the stage is yours so as i already said i i hail from perth australia uh, and I'm a little bit disappointed that I didn't get to be there in person uh, this year. I've heard amazing things about both of the Build Stuff conferences and was really looking forward to getting to be there in person with you all this year. Although I don't miss having to spend 30 hours on a plane, hopefully I will get to be there with you all again next year or at the very least in 2022. Yeah. In the real world, I'm a freelance front-end developer, which means I spend most of my time at the beach and the rest of it working from home in my pajamas. I'm also heavily involved in the Perth tech community. I helped to run a user group, uh, the Perth Azure user group. I previously helped to run a user group for front-end developers. I'm on the committee for the DDD Perth conference, which is the last, largest tech conference in Perth. I attend all of the Perth tech meetups and work as an evangelist for YAR conferences. Last year, I also became a Twilio champion and a Microsoft MVP. I also have a beautiful gray and white border collie who sits next to me whenever I'm working from home. However, he doesn't actually like sitting next to me when I present. Um, so he's already run away to hide somewhere else in the house. Now, he's also been fairly suspicious of having me at home so much this year. Uh, like, he's expecting me to abandon him for a very long trip every time I leave the house. But today, I'm here to talk to you about testing. Now, we all know that testing is important. That's never been a question. And although there's a lot of debate about whether you should write your code or your tests first, we even have a software process test-driven development that's centered around tests. But despite all these strong opinions, we often don't hear about what's happening on the front end. Now, there are so many different tests that we need to be running on the front end. There's accessibility testing, performance testing, user testing, HTML validation, visual regression testing. It's often hard to work out what we need to test for and where we need to start. So today I'm gonna to go through a few different samples of front-end tests and how we can integrate them in our projects. Now I'm gonna start off with one you may be familiar with, which is linting. Uh, now, linting isn't technically testing. If you're not familiar with it, linting is a type of automated check that usually happens early on in development. It's often integrated uh, with your IDE or your code editor and checks for and sometimes fixes small stylistic errors. Now, today I'm missing and I got today I'm going to be going through and using two testing tools. Uh, one is ESLint and the other one is StyleLint. Uh, now ESLint is for testing JavaScript uh, and, and StyleLint is for testing uh, CSS and SAS and similar style programming languages. Uh, depending on what languages you code in, there'll be other tools out there available for you. Uh, so I'm going to start off nice and easy with um, installing the ESLint package in our project. Now, once we've installed the package, uh, then go through, create a config file inside of our project. This config file is eslintrc.js. Inside of this config file, we want to define three separate properties. Uh, the first is extends, the second is plugins, and the third is rules. Now, extends allows us to extend any existing config that we have elsewhere. Uh, so this is really useful if you're just getting started out with linting and you're not really sure what to do. You can go through and extend 
uh, a previously specified config setup, uh, which today I'm going to go through and I'm going to extend the Airbnb base config because uh, they have a pretty good starting point to go to work from. Uh, next is plugins. You can go through and reference various plugins that you can add to your project. Um, I'm not going to use any of them today. Uh, lastly, uh, we want to go through and specify rules. Now you can use, you can specify individual rules instead of using extends, or you can also use them to uh, expand on rules that the extended config may not look at. Or you can you can use it to um, to override particular settings. Now, once we've gone through and set that up, I am going to go through and run ESLint on my command line. What this is going to do is this is going to go through run my test, and it's going to spit out all the results into a JSON file um, inside my project folder. Uh, and this has given me errors, which is expected um, because it, it's found a few issues in my code. Now, if I go through and have a look at the file that these results, it's then spat out a bunch of different issues. So based on the rules I've specified, it's letting me know that I'm actually not following the rules of my code. So if we have a look at the first one, I can see there's an issue in my ESLint file. Uh, it says that on line 27, um, I have uh, rule, no mixed spaces and tabs, and the message is mixed spaces and tabs. Um, so I'm going to assume that that means on line 27, I'm going to find um, mixed spaces and tabs, which I can in my code. And if I go through and remove that, that will then fix the error. And so I can go through and fix each of the errors that ESLint gets. Um, there are a bunch of different rules that you can use for ESLint. Uh, and they're all available on the ESLint website. Uh, if you want to have a look at the different options you can specify for. Next, I want to go through and do linting on my CSS and uh, want to make sure I go through that's all set up. Now, similar to ESLint, I can run style lint inside the command line. However, this time I want to integrate it with my code editor. So I've installed the style lint extension for VS Code. Uh, there's probably an alternative depending on what code editor you use. I'm also going to set up a config file, style lint RC, uh, similar to ESLint. Uh, this has extends and rules. Also allows me to specify syntax. Uh, so say, for example, if I'm using SAS or less or something like that, I might need to change the, uh, the syntax and also allows me to specify processes which work similar to plugins. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to extend anything. I'm just going to specify a heap of rules about how I like my CSS to be written. And I'm going to go through and set that up. And now this time, instead of running, uh, instead of running my linting in the command line, I actually want to go through and uh, yeah, VS Code will use this config file to check as I'm writing my code in my code editor. So now if I go through and inside one of my files, if I go through and add some extra spaces, I can see I've started to get a couple of um, started to get a couple of red lines. And if I have a look inside the output of my terminal, it's telling me that it expected no more than one empty line uh, in my file. And so if I go through and remove them, that will go through and get rid of them there. So we can integrate this with our code editor to get live feedback on linting as we're writing code. Uh, so similar to ESLint, uh, we can find all of the rules on the style lint website, um, including information about the other ways where we can expand on how we're integrating it with our project. Uh, next, we want to look at accessibility testing. Uh, now, accessibility testing, uh, accessibility testing encompasses a bunch of different things, including validating HTML, checking for alt tags, checking for color contrast, checking whether or not um, your your website or your application is able to be used uh, by screen readers or reader modes. This also is now starting to encompass whether or not your content on your website can be consumed by Google Home and other types of voice assistants. 
Now, to do this, I'm using a testing tool called Pally. Uh, now, this is an open source tool. Uh, it has a few different alternatives. Uh, for example, one of the options for the tool is command, uh, is, um, command line, which I use. Uh, another one is specifically built for integrating with uh, continuous integration systems. They also have a really useful dashboard, which you can set up to track accessibility issues on a regular basis. And this is really useful for if you have any non-technical people in the team, uh, like, a, like a product manager or a client who wants to keep track of any improvements and things that are changing over time. Now, what Pally does is this goes through and tests against the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines uh, or the WCAG. Uh, now, the current guidelines are WCAG 2.1, which are published in 2018. You can find a list of the current guidelines on the website for the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. I'm trying to make sure I get my acronyms right here. Uh, now, the W3C, if you haven't heard of them, is an international community of people. Uh, some are staff and some are public from the community who develop the web standards that we work with every day. The WCAG guidelines cover three different levels of conformance. Uh, so there's the A standard. A standard is the bare minimum. Most sites will meet this level where their site is mostly accessible, but not necessarily convenient for persons with disabilities to use. Double A is the general standard. If you're looking to make your website accessible, double A is probably the standard that you're working towards. And triple A is the highest standard. Um, now, this is usually followed by companies whose websites are specifically built for people with disabilities. So three standards, A, double A, and triple A. Uh, so we can then go through and use Pally. We can let it know what standard we're testing against and uh, go through and test our application. Uh, so the first thing we're doing is installing Pally. Once I've installed it, I'm going to go through and create a test file. Uh, Pally can test uh, no matter what language your application is written in. Uh, however, its tests are written in JavaScript. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to require the Pally package and I'm going to set up a function uh, to run my Pally test in. Now, the first thing that I'm, I'm going to do the first thing that I'm going to do with this um, is I'm going to create a function. Uh, this needs to be an async function uh, because I need to make sure I get my results back. I'm going to get my results through a promise. And inside of that promise, I'm running the Pally function. And for now, I'm just going to pass it in the URL of my website that I want it to test. Then at the end, I want to log out the results to my console. Uh, so I'm going to go through and run that. Um, so once I've written this test, um, this is just using Pally out of the box. I haven't passed in any additional config. Once I've gone through and done that, I want to go through and run my test in the console. Now, because this is a JavaScript file, this is fairly easy to run. I just need to run it with Node, uh, and I've already set up a script to use for this. Now, once I go through and run my test, it's going to spit out results, um, which is really great because um, the console has has then just told me that I have a bunch of issues, uh, all of which are objects. So that's not very user friendly um, for for me to use. So the next thing I want to do is I want to go through and I want to actually put those results into a file so that I can use them. So I'm going to go back to my Pally file again. This time I'm going to require a, a separate node package. Uh, this is the file system package, uh, which is available in Node. And this allows us to save, uh, to save our data to a file inside of our project. Uh, once I've required that package, I then want to replace 
where I'm currently logging my results out to the console. Instead, I want to save those to a file. So if I go through and use the file system, I want to save that to a file test results pally.json. And I want it to put my results in the file and then log out any errors if they happen. So once I've gone through and done that, I can now go through and run my test again. Uh, this time when I run the test, I shouldn't really get anything logging out to the console, but it should create a new file for me to use. Uh, so uh, nothing's logged out to the console, but I have got a new file that's been created inside my project, uh, which I, if I have a look at that, that's given me a lovely long list of accessibility issues on my site. Um, so it's great to know that I've failed a bunch of different things. Uh, now I'm going to go through some examples of what some of these issues look like and how we can actually work out how to fix them. So for each issue, we have a bunch of information inside the object. Now there are only a few things that we actually want to have a look at. There's the code, the message, the context, and the selector. Now, the first thing we want to look at is the context and the selector. This tells us where on our web page we can actually find the accessibility issue. The context will tell us the exact element, uh, which we can see here is an image. Uh, this may be useful, this may not be useful. You've probably got more than one images and you may not have very nice names where you're able to actually recognize them from. So that's where we have the selector as well. So this will tell us where in the DOM this is actually sitting. So if I go through and have a look inside of my developer tools, if I have a look, I can see here is where my image is, which is this image here. So I can find the image that I'm having issues with. So I know that's where it is. Now I want to go back and I want to work out, okay, I know what element the issue is, with, the, I, know, I know what element the issue is with, I want to know what the issue is. If I have a look, I can see here there's the code and the message. Now the code allows me, tells me what WCAG principle guideline it has, uh, it had, has had an issue with, I've been in breach of, uh, and the message is then an error message. So it will tell me that the image element is missing an alt attribute. Use the alt attribute to specify a short text alternative. Now, in this case, this makes sense. Uh, the image is, doesn't have an alt text. And so I need to make sure that I provide an alt text for if people can't actually see the image on the website. Uh, so that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, though, I can look up this guideline to find out more information about it. In particular, I want these numbers at the end of the guideline, so this code here. So I want to grab the end, copy and paste this section. There's then a website where, where we can find all of the guidelines and you can then search on the page for where that particular guideline is. That will give me more information about the section uh, depending on what uh, what level I'm trying to meet and get more information about how it applies and ways that I can fix it. Now, similar to other testing tools, if you're familiar with them, uh, Pally can take a bunch of options when we're running the test. Uh, so you can go through, you can specify actions. So you can actually get, uh, Pally will run tests using Puppeteer as a headless browser. So you can get it to go through and actually do things with your web page before it runs the test. You can specify a viewport, so you can specify a particular screen size and whether or not it's mobile and make sure you're testing against various times. Um, you can specify a particular WCAG standard that you're testing against. By default, it will test against AA, but you might need AAA. You can also pass in headers uh, various method and post data as well if you're dealing with a slightly more complex application where you need to pass that through so that it works. So now we want to go through and add a few of these options to my test. Now inside of the Pally function, 
I now want to pass in the options prop. And inside of that, I want to uh, give it two options. First is the standard. I want to test this against the AAA standard. So I want this to be really accessible. Uh, and the second is screen capture. I can also get Pally to go through and take a screen capture when it's running the test. Um, so I'm wanting it to get a screen capture and save that out to my results folder as well. Now that I've passed these extra options in, I want to go through and run my test again. Getting to the end of a long week. Um, so once I go through and run my test again, um, again, I it's then logged out my results to my Pally file. If I have a look, uh, this will probably give me even more errors because I am actually testing against a higher accessibility standard. This has also taken a screenshot of my application as well. So I can go through and actually see what Pally has seen when it's running the test. Now, these screenshots can be super useful because depending on how you've built your application, it's going to render differently in different browsers. Sometimes things happen in the headless browser that may be different to how you're viewing it in your web browser. And so you might get errors that seem confusing until you can actually see what Pally is seeing in Puppeteer. Say, for example, things like this, uh, where this did not render as I expected it to. Something was definitely really wrong and I wasn't quite sure why I was getting these errors. But when I had a look at the screenshot, I could have a look at this and go, yep, no, that's definitely not right. So these screenshots are really useful debugging tools as well. Now, uh, some of you may have noticed that what I've actually done when setting up my original Pally function is rather than just creating a promise, I've created a list of promises using promise.all. What this allows us to do is this allows us to put in multiple Pally tests and to go through and run them all one after another. Now, this is really useful for then going through and testing multiple pages so that you don't have to go through and run them all manually. Now I can go down and create some new tests uh, further down in my file. And in here, I want to I want to test for various different screen sizes, and I also want to test some different pages. Uh, so here, I want to pass in a viewport that's about a mobile device size. So I want to make sure that everything's accessible there. And I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Uh, and then taking a desktop screen size and taking a screenshot of that. And I'm also changing this. So rather than going to my main blog page, I want to actually go through to a blog post and to run the test against that as well. So I can go through and run against multiple pages or with multiple uh, different sets of options. Now, when I go through and run my test, um, this time will take a little bit longer because I'm now running a test three times. Uh, I'm now running three different tests. And once this is completed, if I have a look at my results folder, I can see I now have a bunch of different screenshots which will appear. So these are the various different screenshots that it's taken while testing. So I can have a look at exactly what's going on there. And if I have a look inside my pally.json folder, uh, I'll have, have a lot of errors here. Uh, but if I have a look in here, I can see I actually have an array of results and inside that array, I've got an object for each of test. So the first is my post, second is the um, mobile, and third is desktop. So I can go through and run, I can go through and run all of these tests one after another. Now the next kind of testing we're going to have a look at is visual regression testing. Now, if you're not familiar with it, visual regression testing is similar to Git diffs. It will take screenshots of your website or application and compares old to new and will then give you the difference. Now, for this, I use a tool called Backstop.js. There are a bunch of different options out there. I decided to use Backstop because they had a really great initialization script which got you set up straight away, ready to go. They gave you a bunch of things to test for. 
uh, already pre-filled out. So that was really easy to get started. Um, I'm not going to go through This is so easy to get started with uh, and because uh, this is a slightly shorter version of my normal talk today, um, I'm not going to go through how we run all of these tests. But what it will go through and do is it will take a screenshot of my application, it will compare it with the reference screenshots we def we've defined, and it will then let us know uh, whether or not things have passed, and it will generate this really nice HTML report that we have here. So this will let me know that two passed, zero failed, and I can see here my reference screenshot and my test screenshot. Uh, so if you're wanting to find out more about Backstop, you can, you can have a look. Um, I've got resources at the end. Uh, one issue with Backstop, uh, with doing visual regression testing though, is it can yield false results. Now, visual regression testing tests pixel for pixel. And so it can sometimes yield failures where it's actually okay. Uh, for example, if images haven't quite loaded in properly, uh, it may still present a difference in the screenshots, even though you haven't actually changed any code, you may get failures running the test, um, like each time you run the test, whether or not you've actually made any code changes. Uh, so that's something to be aware of. There is config that you can uh, you can set up in Backstop uh, to allow you to specify a particular percentage threshold that you're testing for if you want to be a little bit less fussy. However, uh, another alternative that uh, you may want to do is end-to-end -end or UI testing. Now, UI testing is more what uh, I'm, I need to be doing. So I don't need to know whether or not my application is pixel perfect from before. What I do need to know is I need to know that my menu is still there and I can still click on the things and those things will still take me where they're supposed to go um, because there's nothing like making code changes and then not realizing that that's actually affecting a completely separate part of the application. So end-to-end -end testing allows us, end-to-end uh, -end and UI testing allows us to go through and to check for those things instead. Now, I use a tool called Cypress. There are a bunch of different options out there. Uh, you may be familiar with Selenium. I haven't used that before, but I have been told um, by testers that Cypress is infinitely better. Uh, I mainly chose to use Cypress because it was already implemented in a project that I was working on. So I had sort of a bit of a guide to get started with it. Now, uh, we want to go through and install Cypress. Similar to uh, Backstop's initialization command, the first time you run Cypress, it will actually go through and set up your project for you, which is really awesome. So you don't have to get started. Uh, you don't have to spend a heap of time getting started. Uh, so if I go through and run Cypress, um, it will go, hey, this is the first time you've done this. Uh, it will take a while the first time, but if we go through, we can have a look. Uh, this is already creating uh, a Cypress folder and a config file. Inside of the Cypress folder, there's a few different folders. Um, there's fixtures, plugins, support, but the main folder that we're going to be working in today is integration, and this is where we're writing our tests. This also has another folder inside it called examples, which includes a bunch of different example tests. Now, once Cypress does open up, you may, uh, depending on your computer, you may get a bunch of errors. As long as this window opens up, uh, then you should be fine. Uh, this is the Cypress task runner. And so this is where we do a lot of our tests. And inside of that, we can see all of the example tests that Cypress has set up for us. If we go through and click on one of the tests as well, we can uh, we can actually go through and run that test. So this is a sample test that it's already set up for us, and it's then going through and running that against Cypress's sample website. Cool. So now we're going to go through and write some of our own tests. 
Now, Cyprus has a fairly unique, um, if you haven't written tests before, uh, this may seem a little bit weird for you. Um, so it, you will start to get your head around it as you go through and write the test. Um, the first thing we want to do is we want to go through and name our test. We then specify actions that we run at the start of our test. Um, say, for example, visit my website. Uh, and we then go through and write what's called an assertion. Uh, so our assertion could be that our title should can, contain specific text. Now, Cypress uh, does its testing using various different tools, including Chai and Mocha and jQuery. Uh, you can find more information about the assertions and how you can write them, including a bunch of different tutorials on the Cypress website. An assertion is where we will often chain functions together and includes assumptions that we make, for example, expect or should. Um, as I said, they've got some really great tutorial videos on their website as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and start writing a test of my own. So inside the Cypress folder, I'm going to create a new file um, called test because testing is hard. Uh, and inside of that, I'm going to write a couple of tests to test for in my application. Now, um, in here at the start, again, I'm going to describe my test. Uh, now, this is a user-friendly description. Um, again, naming things is hard, so I've just called this blog homepage. Um, I've then gone through and I want to specify what it's going to do at the start of my test. Um, so I want it to actually visit my blog. So I'm going to tell Cypress to visit the blog. The next thing I want to do is I want to check it should contain my testing blog in the title. Uh, so I'm going to check Cypress title should contain and then I pass in the string my testing blog. So the first part of my assertion, uh, this is me describing what I'm testing again, what I'm testing for. So this is my description and then I'm going to chain my assertions together. I then want to check uh, that uh, I contain blog posts inside of my blog feed. Uh, so I want to get, uh, now this uses jQuery selectors or CSS selectors if you're familiar with them. So dot feed, it's an element with a class of feed. And then inside of that, I want to find an article element. So I want to just make sure there's at least one. Then I want to check that all posts contain a title. So I want to get all article elements. And then inside of that, I want to get a H2 element. So I want to make sure that there's a H2 inside of each article. Lastly, I want to check that I can access my posts via the article title. Uh, so in here, I want to get the article. I want to get a H2 inside of the article. And then I want to get a link inside of the H2. That will give me, that will give me a list of all of the elements on the page that actually meet that requirement. So I just want to get the first one and then I want to click on it. Just want to click on it and make sure that will take me somewhere. Once I've done that, um, I can then go through and run my test inside of the Cypress task runner. Okay, so I want to go through and run my test inside of the task runner. If I open up my task runner again, I can see here that my test file has appeared. And if I click on that, that will go through and run my test. Um, now this should run fairly quickly depending on how many things you're testing for. The first thing um, I was testing for is contains my testing blog in the title. I can go through and hover over the various steps inside of the test and actually have a look at what everything looked like at that point in time. Uh, so I can see here where it's getting the feed. So this is my feed element and then it's getting the articles inside of the feed element. Uh, I can see the same that each of them has a title so I can get an article and then the H2 inside of those articles. And lastly, I want to check that I can access the posts via the article title. 
Uh, so I want to go through and it will get the article H2A, which I can see all those links there. It's going to get the first one, which is here. And then when it clicks on it, it's going to go through to my blog page, which it has. So yay, all of my tests have passed the first time, uh, which will probably never happen ever again. Now, similar to, uh, similar to the other testing tools that we've gone through, we can go through and run multiple tests at the same time. You can create new test files or you can describe new tests further down inside of the same test file. So next I want to go through and describe a new test. Uh, this time I want to be testing against the mobile size of my blog post. Similar to in our first test, in our before section, where we're describing what Cypress should do before it runs our test right at the start, uh, we can, again, let it know to go to a particular web page, but we can also specify a particular viewport size. Now, you can pass in a width and height, or you can pass in one of several predefined devices uh, that are ready for you to use. So, for example, here I want to test that, um, that this is working on a Samsung S10 size device. I then want to make sure that uh, my blog posts on a Samsung S10 size device uh, has a visible post title. Uh, here, I want to check, uh, I want to get a H1 and should be visible. And I want to check that I can navigate back to the home by clicking on the site title. So now it's going to go through and run all of my tests again. Uh, it's going through and one of my tests has failed. What's going on? So the first thing I'm going to double check, I can see there it's looking at a Samsung S10 device size. It's visited my page. Um, it's then expected to get a H1. And if I have a look, I can see it's found a H1. Um, but you can see here, although it's found a H1, something's definitely not quite right. Um, so even though this is going through and running tests and that has said that it's passed, we still need to actually look through and make sure that things are appearing the way we expect them to. However, it did fail on the navigate back to home because it couldn't find my site title element. So now if I go through and have a look inside of my header file, I can see that my code has changed and I no longer have a class of site title on the element that I expect it to find. So now if I go through and add that back, I can run my test again. And this time, if I go through and run my test again, this should pass everything the first time. It should pass everything. Um, and it does. So now it's actually been able to find my site title element. So it's been able to find the element with a class of site title. And when it clicks on it, it goes back to my main blog page. So that all works. Now, so far we've set up linting, accessibility testing, visual regression testing, and end to end testing. Now this is pretty awesome. And this is plenty of stuff for us to all get started with testing our front ends. Uh, when we go back to work on Monday. It's Friday, right? I'm pretty sure it's Friday. Um, so this is pretty exciting that we've managed to get this done in about 45 minutes, including a few technical difficulties. Now, uh, I've only been able to give you so much information today. So there are plenty of resources where you can look to find more information later. Uh, there was a really great talk, uh, more in-depth talk on using Pally for accessibility testing at NDC London last year. I recommend checking that one out. Uh, I also wrote a blog post uh, about this time last year. It was a Christmas themed blog post, so it's almost relevant again, uh, which was on front-end testing, covering a lot of different things, including testing tools and a few of the testing concepts that I either brushed over or didn't get a chance to touch on today. Uh, I also have a 
blog post, uh, Getting Started with Front End Testing. Uh, this is more in-depth, going through step-by-step -step the process we've gone through today. If you'd like to read through something a little bit slower when you get back to work on Monday. Uh, I also have uh, all of these slides online uh, available for you to access at this link. This also includes links to all of the resources that I've mentioned. Um, and this also includes, uh, I updated I updated my demo videos. So these also include captions as well. So if you're wanting to look back at the slides later on, there are now captions on them. So you can actually hear my random musings and explanations of the demo as, as you go through and have a look at them. Thank you very much uh, for, for watching my talk this, this after, I think it's, I think it's afternoon then, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining in my talk. Um, I think we've got some time for questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we have some questions, but first of all, we have some nice uh, comments for you. Uh, Debbie, written in somewhere in the middle of your talk, she said, this is cool, I haven't used it before. I'm not sure which function function she's talking about, but still. Uh, and um, Carol is saying, great, great presentation, big thanks. Um, and also Carol, Carol, before he said uh, he, that he loves border, border collies, that you mentioned your dog. Uh, and the question, <laughs> question we have uh, from Carol is uh, why Cypress over Selenium? Um, so as I said, uh, Cypress was already implemented in another project that I worked on. Uh, so I sort of had some code that I could look at for examples, uh, and there were a couple of people I talked to that have used Cypress and Selenium, and they've kind of said that hands down Cypress is just infinitely better, and sort of once they'd used it, they found it really hard to go back to Selenium again. 